Remember there's Erev and Boker. Erev is and the evening and the morning. Ab the evening and the morning. We're talking about that in Genesis 1. The Jewish day is Erev, Boker. Erev, Boker. And the evening and the morning. And the evening and the morning. So Erev, Erev Rosh Hashanah. In other words, the evening of Rosh Hashanah on September 22nd of 2025. If you go 20 to 1290 days forward, you end up on the fifth day of the Passover sacrifice. Right in the middle of the sacrifice. And if you go 1335 days past that, you end up on Erev Shavuot, which is the very first day of Pentecost. I find that interesting, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Uh, the only other thought, the only other time in this 10-year period, in our next 10 years of life, that this could have any meaning was, er and again, it only ever happens where Rosh Hashanah is the beginning point. The 1295 and the 1330, or the 1290 and the 1335 time frames, never happen with any other beginning point other than Rosh Hashanah. Never. There's no time frame between any other Jewish holiday where it's always 1290 days unless the starting point is Rosh Hashanah. So, if you look at Rosh Hashanah 2027 and you go 1290 days forward, you end up in Peshach 6, which is the there's seven days the Passover sacrifice. Seven days to the Passover celebration on the eighth day, there's a final feast. But if you look in 2027, there's 1,290 days there. It ends up in Passover. And if you go 1,335, again, you end up in Shavuot, which is Pentecost. So let's talk about this for a second. Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the year, the Jewish year. It would make sense to me that a leader would step in and say, as of the beginning of your new year, you're not doing sacrifices anymore. It's a very political move. I could see that happening. I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just saying it's believable. 1290 days later puts you in the middle of the feast of Passover, which is the first feast of the new year. The interesting part about that is we have one scripture <coughs> that said, we just read it, that says in the midst of the week, he causes the sacrifices to cease. So I started thinking, I wonder if that could be, and I'm not saying that this is it, I'm just saying I think it's interesting, that the Passover celebration is known as the week. That's another term for it. So I, it's, it could be that in the midst of the Passover celebration, he causes the sacrifice to cease. Just another thought. Anyways, when you look at this here, I think it's fascinating that if it were to start, if this, if the beast man sets up his image in the holy place on Rosh Hashanah at the beginning of the new year is saying, starting now, I am Messiah. I'm a control freak. I am in control. And as of today, I am Messiah. And just so you don't forget, we're going to start it at the beginning of a new year. Rosh Hashanah. So, and then you go forward 1290 days and his kingdom then would be, it would end right in the middle of the Feast of Passover, which seems believable to me and pretty cool given the fact that the Passover sacrifice Jesus would be, is the king. I mean, he's the one that dethrones this man, is Jesus. Shavuot is known as the Feast of First Fruits. So the Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, is when the harvest, the spring harvest has happened, you bring in your spring harvest. It's the first fruit, the first fruits of the spring. It's the spring celebration that celebrates the first fruits. It was the feast, the Pentecost. The feast of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit was poured out in the upper room to everybody that was waiting there. It was the feast of first fruits, spiritually speaking. So Jesus died, and then 40 days later, you have the Holy Spirit poured out. It's the feast of first fruits. So when I look at when I look at these dates, and the only time 1290 and 1335 land anywhere on the Jewish calendar that has anything to do with the Jewish holiday, it's always Rosh Hashanah, Passover, and the Feast of the First Fruits. Always, 100% of the time. And the only two times that it happens, the only two times that it happens in the next 10 years are September 22nd of 2025 
and October 1st of 2027. So, let's say this, just hypothetically speaking. If, if the seven year period of the beast man were to begin, it would have to begin three and a half years prior to September 22nd, 2025, which would make it roughly March 15th, 2023. So if, for example, I'm just going to use the United States as an example, purely as an example. If President Biden were to no longer be president, say by January or February sometime, and a new person were to be placed in his position by March, and that person fits the rest of the scriptures, that person could be the beast. And if that's the case, he probably will set himself up as the Messiah, September of 2025. That'll kick off the final three and a half years term. So I'm watching to see what happens because I'm kind of curious. I just think it's interesting because we have a lot of stuff in our nation happening right now that could set up a very interesting chain of events, January, February, March of next year in our nation. That's not even including the rest of the nations, but in our nation, you know, I mean, let's just hypothetically speaking say that you have a Republican Party that ends up taking the House and the Senate. They decide they don't like the President and the Vice President. They impeach them. They appoint somebody as the Speaker of the House. That person becomes the President. So I'm watching because I think it's interesting. But I think the dates are kind of fascinating. Uh, if it were to be the 2027, it would be March of 2025, which again is interesting because we have the 2024 vote coming up. So if we're part of the scripture, it can either, for us to be involved, it could happen February, March of 2023, it could happen February, March of 2025, and in both cases we have election cycles. Do we play a part in it? I don't know. But I just think it's interesting to think about. That's all. So let's take a break, and we'll come back and pick up Matthew 24 where we left off, because now we know what the abomination of desolation is. We know who the beast man is. We know that he comes after the saints. We know that he comes after the Jews. We know that he wears them out. We know that the Jews and the saints are given into his, into his hand for three and a half years. He gets the chance to chase them down, to kill them, to destroy them. We know that many will be made white, that they'll be tried. We know um, that his rule will be global. We know that he is, that this person is a vain person, prideful, arrogant, consumed. We know that he is a haughty horn with eyes and a big mouth. Uh, we know that he, we believe that at this point, it's believable that he comes from the West because the ships of Tarshish, from the ships of Turkey, I should say, Shittim, they end up turning him around. We know that he fights against the kings of the north, which are Russia. We know that he fights against the kings of the south, which would be in the continent of, of Africa. We know that he fights against the uh, kings of the east, which would be Iraq, Iran, uh, potentially China. We know that he has dealings, favorable dealings for a period of time with the nation of Israel. So we know that the nation of Israel happens to like this person at the beginning, that he makes an agreement with the prince of Israel, and that in the midst of the agreement that he makes with the nation of Israel, he reneges on that and by a small military presence establishes himself in the nation of Israel. But we know that he starts off as a favored person with the nation of Israel. So that's where we leave the abomination of desolation. Now that we have a definition, we'll go back to Matthew 24, we'll pick up there and we'll keep going. So let's take a few minutes to take a break, go to the bathroom and whatnot.